Well, thank you all for coming. Hope you all enjoyed the conference so far. ISSA in North Texas in particular is a great program, and uh, if you're new to it, welcome to it. And if you're part of it, long-term member of it, keep up the great work because it's a showpiece for the country. And there's a lot of great stuff. Heard some killer sessions on uh, hacking, uh, pen testing, some kind of stuff. Like that. There's, a, there's a lot of groups. I met a few people that have other groups that sit in between. So network and get to know those folks. Um, my name is Ed Higgins, and I'm a compliance and uh, security specialist. And that's kind of a loose association with the generalist that crosses everything from the technical down in the nuts and bolts. I've been a forensic investigator for probably about half of my career. My career, my spouse scars about 30 years in the IT business. And uh, been a PCI QSA for about six of them. Um, started a couple of forensics companies. So I've been around, and um, generalist is probably a good space to play. You know, what, I, what I'm going to do today is to talk about the amalgamate of uh, some of these things um, called uh, where an approach um, might fit some of the things that are evolving in our space. So without Welcome, come on in. So zero trust, legacy perimeter, I think you can see where this may be going. Forrester put out a, a quote, here it is. It says the perimeter of information security is no use because the digital boundaries are changing. The quote is a little bit fancier, but it kind of gets to the, the heart of it. Um, I think we see that uh, you know, these things, we'll touch upon all of that. And I hope, uh, how many here are, you know, uh, technical security people? Show hands. And how many are business side or compliance and audit? Yes. Well, we blend it. Okay, so it's cool that we blend them both, but it's a good, good, good split. I'm hoping that today's session has a good mix of things for all, all of you. If, if you're, if you're you know, kind of a student of this stuff, uh, zero trust model, you know, like the woman here said, um, trust nothing until it burns the right. That's, that's, the, that's the answer. And um, we'll kind of go through that and kind of show where some of those rationale come from. So, there's probably a long, long, long dotted line of additional things that make up our challenges, but the, the data is more mobile than ever. Um, Self-explanatory. We got stuff in the cloud. We got shadow IT, putting stuff in Dropbox. You know, there's all sorts of that. And um, this consequence, the perimeter is failed. Um, we'll play around with that a little bit in just, just, just a moment. But I put this thing here, mapping requirements to solutions. More, more about mapping requirements, whether they be audit or whether they be security best practice or whether they be uh, your own objectives, but mapping those things to the behaviors, the process, the policy, the people, the technologies you use. Those, that's what I mean by solutions. So mapping to meet password strength requirements, we do this. So we go through those exercises of mapping as, um, as practitioners. And that way, when we liaise with our audit colleagues, we, uh, we show them where the proof points are when they carry out an audit, whether that be just an internal audit or external regulated audit. Can everyone in the, hear me okay? okay? And I apologize, I've got a little bit of a last weekend cold to try to get rid of. So I'll try to keep my hands off you and not, uh, not uh, spread that little cold. Um, and then silos. Uh, we'll show a picture of that. We'll probably figure it out. But technologies, whether we have, uh, you know, who here has antivirus for their corporate environment? Every hand goes up. How many of you all realize you may have three or four products of 
antivirus. You may have Lookout on your mobile devices. You may have McAfee on your PC and endpoints. You may have uh, uh, someone else on your Linux boxes, something for your Macs, albeit that they, you know, they're, they're subject to a, a practice. So we may have three or four different technologies. They're all in and of themselves may work pretty well, but they don't tend to talk together. Um, that's just one of silo. So your SIDM, log management, events, IDSs, you get the idea. Managing them is kind of cumbersome. Um, and then, you're all sharp people. You probably work with all of your technologies, and you, 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 we all become uh, jacks of all trades, masters of none. The technologies are constantly changing. And um, it's hard to keep up with them. Um, so if I got 20 security tools in my enterprise, uh, finding that person, you know, who here has a 40-person IT security staff that isn't a $5 billion company? Nobody's kidding. I knew that answer. I never seen, seen it. Um, I had a, uh, was part of 70,000 employee base, we were taking care of about 10 million end user incidents. And proportionally, my security organization as the guy underneath the CISO, our organization was uh, 150 people taking care of 10 million endpoints. So, and, and, and we didn't have the expertise to stay on top of those tools because we were fighting fires all day long. So kind of that continuum. So let's go through these a little bit. Data more mobile than ever. That's that you know is kind of emblematic of it. It's not going to stop. Um, reaching out to customers in new exciting ways. Um, how many feel I do? Security has been a, kind of an impediment to business developmental business relationships with customers and partners because we say no. So keep that in mind. We, we, we have said no. You can't do that on my network. But we have to change. We have to kind of look at a different way of doing things um, because our business um, thrives on making money. and. We need to help enable that. And some of these new enablers are letting our workforce do things with the corporate resources from anywhere on the planet. Um, you know, I've got three kids, three of them which are millennials, every single one of them. And I'm a techie guy. My son's a techie guy, but he's far superior to me. But every one of them is on top of the mobile devices, they, I mean, they mix social and work. I do too, but, and we all do, but there's a difference. There, um, that generation is leading the way in how things evolve for us. And I'll tell you what, there's a lot more of them coming into the workforce, which is a great thing. We need to, we need to kind of embrace that and we need to kind of grow that, but as baby boomers, traditional baby boomers, whatever that is, retire on the tail end of that, maybe the Gen X is what it's called, the generation after that, so I'm kind of a tweener. But call me on that side too. Uh, when we all start moving off and handing the baton to the next group, um, that's, our, that's our decision maker. There's a lot of them in, in positions of strength and power, and they see this as superior ways of doing things. And you know what? They're absolutely right. So data being more mobile than ever, it's not going to change. And that's our B2B relationships, our B2C relationships, and our employees using email, our employees using HR, doing their 401k on a train. So not new, but just bring it together. Now, here's the one that's kind of interesting. Not not, uh, we know what a firewall is. A firewall is a device that has multiple network uh, interfaces in it. 
and with the operating system of the device and the controls you can establish zones of anyone? Trust. Right. And the key word there is trust. It, what it does is it, it says, all right, the outside side, the red zone, I've got my brick wall from my Visio stencils. <laughs> and I look at the outside side untrusted. I've got a DMZ, demilitarized zone, DMZ, which is a zone of, um, I still don't trust you, but I trust you a little more. <clears throat> and then I may have multiples of that. And then I get to the trusted zone. And you know what? <laughs> Statistics show us that most of our cracking that has occurred has happened from the inside out. So what's, up, what's wrong with that picture? What's wrong with the picture is we naturally have trusted stuff on the inside as being uh, safe, protected. Our, our DevOps has said, well, it's an instrument. And th this, is, this is one thing that's changing with application development. Most of the application developers that I know don't want to redo it over and over again. So they're developing apps as if they were going to be put out on the outside anyway. So they don't have to do it, you know, go from nothing security-wise to, you know, 10 security-wise um, when it becomes a requirement. So they're developing that as part of the process great stuff. But um, there was a time in which the authentication mechanisms, the encryption of passwords across the wire, port 80 instead of, you know, Excel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, it's because we all trusted that. God bless you. So as the adage says in their GUI center of trusted systems with relaxed rules. Um, just a little sample. Who's sub firewall rules expert manages firewall rules has kind of been in the, okay. So deny any, deny all, deny port from here to there. How many of you are familiar with allow any out? Allowing in would be a really bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, deny, deny any out is not uh, 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 allow any out. So it says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to block all the bad stuff from coming in, but I'm going to allow my users, because I don't have time to deal with them saying, I can't get into drill so. That's your standard home firewall. It is. It, it is indeed. And, and the, the, the any, any means any. So we compromise our internal device, whether it's a SQL server or a financial reporting system or a laptop. It's all the same. And so the trust mall is, um, is kind of one that we need to look and say, something's up with that in the perimeter. Because of that boundary, the digital Boundaries expanding and expanding. Um, there is no more perimeter. So let's kind of address that. So, no thank you to the traditional perimeter model. And that's where my, I forgot to click the little good thing. My animation's broke. <clears throat> but that's the target. And um, bad guy out here compromises someone in here. He might have skipped over that whole thing by giving someone a bogus thumb drive or dropping a bag of thumb drives in the parking lot. Everyone shoves them in and Christmas. <laughs> and that's the guy that gets compromised right there, the jewels. Now here's that thing about mapping requirements. This is designed, this slide I put together to be messy. Because it is messy. Uh, HIPAA, who here is in the healthcare space and deals with HIPAA? How's that translation been? <laughs> Back in 80, 89, 90, when that thing was kind of getting some teeth, and I think it might have been 2001. 90 was when it came out. Yeah, but Barbara McGowan was trying to get some uh, facilitation with. Uh, commercial sector to help get some teeth in it. And I tried to work with it, probably about 
250 of us that were from the commercial sector, security experts trying to help. I, I left it. I, I, I got so fr frustrated. I, I, you know, maybe I was a little spunkier and couldn't make a dent in it, but I, I couldn't. You, you can't just say reasonable, try your best. Have a nice day. And we read those things in HIPAA still to this day. Now, omnibus rule, high tech, a lot of great stuff has come along to help that, but this whole, oops, that's a different one. This whole thing, NIST, uh, financial sector, and kind of the insurance sector. Uh, New York DFS, you guys familiar with that one? Yeah. Uh, New, NYDFS is a uh, regulation from in the banking space that New York instituted because the Wall Street banks and you know, the, the bad things that could happen if something bad happened in there. And we're all in, in, in that space to be affected by it. So uh, they instituted something called New York DFS. And it kind of ties to NIST and it's pretty strong. It's, you know, first step, you need to have a CISO that reports, CISO. Some people say CISO, I say CISO just because not to be different, but that's just the way I know to say it. So you have to have one that reports to the board. And um, they don't report to the board from the org chart standpoint. They sign off on the worthiness of the controls for the financial sector. So now the, like Sarbanes-Oxley had some teeth with um, CEOs and CFOs on the financial reporting system, go directly to jail if you, you know, break the rules. Uh, I don't know if there's litigation like that for for a CISO to be brought up, but they have to sign their name and it's personal that they've reviewed the controls and they apply to the board and then the board underwrites them. That's carrying over to the insurance space also because I think it's FIDC, uh, no, NAIC is uh, kind of the governance body over the insurer, insurer, insurers, and so forth. They're getting pretty um, concerned about people's data, the insurers, the payers, and so forth for life insurance, health insurance, etc. So they're uh, getting kind of concerned with how are we going to meet this and they've been talking about NIST and um, I think it's going to be somewhere around April or May where they'll come out from the, NA, N, the, the insurance side, NAIC to kind of institute governance uh, that kind of ties to NIST, and they may very well adopt this New York DFS as the way, and more banks are looking at New York DFS. But why I said all that, it's complex. There's hundreds of security requirements. They get into the mapping of everything you've got to meet an objective. I went through a NIST, uh, <coughs> an attestation, but an assessment where there were 285 control objectives that were kind of intertwined, and each of them had technologies, people, process, bodies that were at least at least six or seven components underneath every single one of them. So it's not just, I have a password system, and it meets my password checkbox. It isn't that way. It says, access control, limit passwords to this apply to more than one factor for authentication. So you've got different things that meet that requirement and the way the language is and the way that interpretation we shared at the moment. <laughs> because the interpretations in some of these are uh, loose and HIPAA lets you figure it out. And uh, there are several others that, that do the very same thing. Who here is excited about GDPR? Sorry. <laughs> Wrong words. Um, we just, our company, I work for Catapult Systems, and our company does security solutions. We do an awful lot of IT security and IT consulting for customers. We just hosted a, one of our partners is a shop called Pivot Point Security. They're an audit shop, very good one. And Alex and myself were on a kind of a it was a webinar, but it was like a talk conference question. I am seated, asked her questions. She's a super guru lawyer. She answered the, the, the questions. Uh, Alex, uh, I had a total time. 
but we've worked together in, in quite a few engagements. And uh, there's some interesting stuff. If you really want to feel the mojo with uh, interpretation of compliance objectives, Google, Google GDPR and get into that because it's uh, a citizen. Uh, 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 this isn't about that, but here's an example. Um, a natural person, a citizen of any country of the EU, has the right to be forgotten. And a data controller might be a business firm that collects that natural person. So let's just say citizen. Um, their name, their phone number, their email address. And they're a controller. So they de de decide what to do with that data. Well, we're going to send it to marketing. We're going to send all sorts of great literature. We're going to sell them a widget, whatever. And um, they acquire that. There's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's what we do here. And then uh, a processing, a data processor might be a partner of that controller. So that company may be in the, in the EU somewhere. And there may be a, a, a U.S. company that might be doing services, partnered with that, that person might incidentally process that data. So we become, that, that company in the U.S. becomes a data processor. And uh, now that citizen says, I have the right to be forgotten. I want you to forget me. The requirement is that's removed from everything, a backup. Most are solid state backups anymore, but the backup tape. Get them all, remove them all for that, or mask them in such a way. There's ways to not get around it, but there's ways to comply with that. And there's pretty heavy fines. I think 4% of the, the business entity's uh, revenue, or 20 million euros, whichever is the biggest. So it's pretty. <coughs> Pretty tough, and it can cascade. A colleague asked, "How can EU uh, enforce something in the states?" Well, there's a thing called uh, privacy. Privacy. It's kind of like safe harbor. Privacy shield is what it is. And there's country to country relationships that are establishing jurisdiction to allow for you know, fines to be levied to U.S. companies. So if you have a partner in the EU, and you do work with data from any person in the EU, and uh, you know, the data, the bad, the bad data, sensitive data is not the first name, not John Smith, but John Smith and a phone number, John Smith and an address, John Smith and a something else. So just the name by itself, this is John Smith's in the US, everyone's. And the same with every single name. So. Um, it's the combination, there's a pretty clear definition for that, but it's, it's got some teeth and it takes effect May, next May, 25th, I think. So you really do have to get acquainted with what regulations you have and what, um, uh, what technologies you have in your environment. So that helps establish what, what, what your data is, what impacts it. Uh, and then, what are the regulating bodies? Not every one of these shown here is a regulating body. 27,000 is, is a standard. NIST is a standard. But like HIPAA, PCI, DSS, FISMA, GDPR, and IDFS, they all kind of draw into uh, the requirements and mandates. If you play with that kind of information, you must adhere to these controls. Silos of technologies. We, you know, kind of, we have to manage, we have to wear the hat. And this is, this is just tiny. This is not a product I know, or this is a slide I found out on the internet. It looked like a pretty good picture, but there's probably a thousand more that are security technologies that may, some of which, many of which, the industry averages, there's, um, 16 to 20 technologies that are security related in, in any enterprise. Enterprise and small businesses, I'm not going to count them because they, they, may, they may have them, 
but they may not be able to afford that many, so they do the best they can with what they've got. I'm talking about the, you know, bigger size businesses have got, you know, that, that metric. So, remember we talked about finding the experts. There's a few stats. The gaps, the risks are increasing, so is the need for security. These slides would be, you know, I don't know if they're noteworthy, but there's a few good articles that come from these. Those are all highlights from very good articles that are linked inside that. So if we can share the slide deck, it'd be, there's something you can get. When you click on it, you'll, you'll be able to draw that in. <clears throat> but we're overwhelmed by alerts. Uh, I don't remember my animation here. Um, and then we need more full-time experts. The interesting thing is wasting time on uh, the programs, those tools, those silos we have, lots of false positives, and um, difficult to you know create um, priority when we're chasing one. I wrote an article not so long ago, maybe half a year ago, on when I was trying to patent the phrase uh, a deceptive denial of service attack, triple DOS. I said, that's mine, whoever, <laughs> I want that one before anyone else claims it. But it was, um, you know, someone throws a distributed denial of service at your front door. Everyone, all three of us, run over to the front door and we're treating that. Meanwhile, all the jewels are being taken out the back door. Not one common. And they're starting to splice these type of attack vectors as far as they being the bad guys. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're having a hard time mm -hmm. keeping up with that. Uh, the good news is, <laughs> tongue in cheek, this October, the number of malware variants dropped from 50 million to 48.8 million. Yay! <laughs> um, here's one that's very interesting. Microsoft said it, and, you know, our, the business I work for, we have a lot of customers. We're a Microsoft partner, but our job spans outside of Microsoft, you know, Linux system. It's, it's all in there. Everyone's environment has multiple. But we have a lot of Microsoft clients. When I read this, I went, that's very interesting. I said, I said show me that. So if you, if you if can, you know, Google words, they have a pretty stellar white paper out there. And, and it's not so Microsoft-centric. Uh, and I'm not knocking them that way. But uh, a bad guy, once he gets into your environment, on average, can stay 200 days. Imagine that. I did pen testing. I did a couple of tests for um, energy producers. That's about all I can say with it. It was a NERC SIP assessment, the pen test. And sit in the conference room with your laptop, no instruction. Can you, uh, can you compromise the critical zones? critical uh, infrastructure section. I jump on the WAP. I look at the network. The WAP let me on the corporate LAN because it was that way. I'm like, wow, this is pretty cool. I move over to the uh, scanning phase reconnaissance. We'll go through an attack chain and uh, saw an abandoned exchange server. Jumped over, cool. Score, exactly. Password, password. And owned it. And not nothing special about, well, that one, to me, that was a treat. Because I'm like, wow, this just illuminated about five hours or 10 hours or maybe 20 hours of reconnaissance to try to claim something. Huh? Yeah, yeah. What I was able to do was start um, Wireshark. Ethereal on that and look for it. And I found the guy that kept logging into that in the conversations of traffic over and over and over again. Same dude. I'm like, wow, oh, it's interesting. There's his password. Square little away, note to self. Then move over and see VPN traffic. I can't see what goes on after he connect, you know, starts it, but I'm like, that's my guy. He's in he's in the admin group. So I learned his account, became him, used his VPN, 
got right into where the red button is to, sh to change valves in the SCADA control systems. And that business learned a lot. It, it, I can't say the name of the business, but we helped them. And they helped themselves because they instituted processes. So they didn't, they had, they're, and they're a big organization, but they didn't have even close to the resources to deal with it. And our nation critical infrastructure or our nationals, nation's sensitive resources are being targeted by nation states. Now, this was a few years ago, so I imagine the, you know, three to be exact, but it wasn't a long time ago. Three, lots, lots of what could happen. Isn't it true that most people only find out they've been hacked when their stuff's being sold? Yeah. Uh, what's that name? Oh, man. Uh, Equifax. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's bad. I'm, I'm trying to figure out where to begin writing a blog. Like companies, marketing groups said, we'd like to write something. I'm like, you know, I can't write anything that isn't going to be taken as nasty because I really don't feel there's anything productive about what I have to say. I mean, yeah, I need to figure out a way to. There's so many opportunities for good, <laughs> good guidance, but first I have to just kind of clear my head of how I feel about that. And I'm sure we all feel the same way about those kind of incidents. When if we're security people, you know, even the IT people, we're, we're, we're part of the same family. And when something like that happens, it's like, really? You, we represent a, a kind of a kind of a, an army of security professionals that come to uh, ISSA and ISACA and ISC Squared and we pay our dues, we get the you know scars on our butt from working real hard. And then you you see that kind of negligence and then blame it on a dude or a lapse and uh, was it Mandiant was telling them you gotta know, patch that server. And you know what? That's policy in most of these systems. And it's a, it's a policy that would say, automatically patch the server and allow the admin three times to postpone it. And then do it the fourth time. That's not seven months, that's seven days. They could have done that, and, and here we are. That's what that means. Yeah, exactly. So, it's a shortage. It indicates that it's a shortage of, it's not skill. It's time to be experts in everything and um, and get the get our management. It is, this is another slide deck altogether. Getting management to understand and for us to help write the justifications for something that sustains because you know what we are an insurance policy as security people you know nobody appreciates that until something bad happens and we can show that we say nope bad stuff happened but we stopped it never happened nothing lost excellent you've earned your salary for the year but all those saves that never get you know it goes under the mattress and that's never a whining posture yes sir I only think it's because though um, organisations are not thinking outside the box about recruitment. I mean, the example is the typical noise defence, and everybody's heard it, is autism or Asperger's when they catch a hacker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's become, you know, I see it every time, it's just stupid. But actually, it's true that we, we, you know, my corporation must have a degree. You don't need a degree to be the security analyst. No. Okay? But, and it's stupid, and actually, yeah. the, therefore, because they're not thinking outside the box and they're not taking on more creative people, they don't get through the interview process because they maybe have a character flaw. Yeah. Well, that's actually ma what makes them really go at security because they can think nasty. We want people who can think nasty, who can okay. break things, and we're not teaching people to break things anymore, like mm -hmm. what I used to be when I was a kid. It's a great, it's a great point. Uh, I met Kevin Mitnick a few times. In fact, I met one of his victims, a guy I know, a good guy. And he was the guy that answered the phone. You know, Mitnick was this social engineer. He'd smooch you on the phone and say, hey, I'm stuck in here. You tell me what my password is. I'm the CEO. And then a social engineer, that's all he was. Uh, 
but he was the you know one of those early pioneers of that, if you will. And he was from the phone space, so he's got a bit of a history. His victim was a help desk guy that passed it through, and I know him pretty well. And uh, for so many years, and I, I still am torn about Mitnick being in the consortium. We're not an elite group, but we've. You know, I don't love the fact that this guy was a felon and now we want to embrace him in and, you know, be, be a security expert. But I think there's a balance between that. I think this is kind of what you're getting at. Um, Equifax CISO had a degree. Hmm. <laughs> so what's wrong with you, sir? One day, it? There's about 20 music. threads about what her degree was. This is music. Yes, music. And most of engineers, uh, I'm an engineer by trade at Double E. I designed computer chips for a few, few years till I decided I wanted to be in the IT side. Um, but I'm a musician. Lots of engineers or techies tend to draw from that. Maybe it's the math, maybe it's the art expression. Maybe we're all nerds. Yeah, whatever it is. Don't try and this the girls. Don't, don't yeah. try and play Bark, because Bark is basically coding, and that's how I learned to code. Because Bark was code, which is repetitive stuff, and you can do it. That's what music is. Yeah. And I'm a musician too. Yeah. And I mean, oh, let's do it. Show of hands, who are people who play music in one form or another on any instrument at all? That's a pretty good percentage for you. Well, there's a shortage of us. I digress. I wanted to kind of expand upon it. Great points, though, and I think you're right. I think um, I think stuff that prevents these things in the middle from happening academically, formula, how to logically think and process. You get that in college. I did. We all did. We all did. Um, the how to how to weasel your way through the system to find all the things that bad guy's going to do. Um, as a pen tester, I go really dark with my, not my behavior, but with my mindset. How, how can I inflict as much pain on this target to accomplish my mission without them even knowing about it? So I have to get my mind in that, and I'm not, I'm not an evil person. Um, so you, you have to kind of move over to that. And I wouldn't even characterize myself as a very great pen tester. I'm pretty good, but there's guys that are in circles around me all day long, probably in this room. Actually, they're probably not in this room. They're like, I don't have time for this. <laughs> <laughs> Just a couple of things on along the attack vectors. <clears throat> the kill chain, they call it, we call it. Um, there's a couple of similarities between this slide and the slide I'm going to show you. They're almost the same. The advanced persistent threat is the kind of the topic. And you know, it starts with that. Uh, I, I, the, the statistics change so much. Um, I think it's 70, it's north of 70% that compromises in the industry, breaches, legitimate, well, any breach is legitimate, but ones that, that, that do damage, that are successful, that's what I mean. 70% um, of them occur from compromised identity. And then there's another percentage, that's 78%, I think, are from the inside. And that's not malicious. Some of it is. But a bigger percentage is by our accidents, make mistakes, the wrong setting on an Azure, or a less share, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And things get open. Or uh, seeing the patterns, but not having enough time to get to it because you're inundated. Uh, I think. It was on the previous slide, I didn't even cover it, 47,000 average SOC sees a day. I think that number is probably eight months too old. Um, one, one space, it was by sector, I saw one thing, I just said, why I wrote, you know, quotation by generalized. I'm like, I saw too many different numbers. 
and I saw most most security operations centers for businesses. That's a small shop of dedicated pros trying to do the right thing around the clock and prevent bad stuff from happening to their company, period. We see 10,000 events a day. They can't keep up with that to, to deal with them. Um, and then on the targeted side, 150,000 new attack alerts a day. How do you deal with that? You don't get a lunch. <laughs> and I'm not laughing at them. I'm laughing with them because they're laughing going, we can't keep up with this. It's very, very difficult to keep up with them. But back to this. That's where it starts. You know, it's 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 spear phishing, it's you know, wide cast phishing. It, it is compromising an, an account, it's because we <coughs> suck at managing our passwords as users. And uh, what I mean by that is um, your corporation may implement a good password strength and a good combination, and you don't want to remember it again. You don't have a, a key safe to kind of help you out. And so you use the same one for your Google. You use the same one for your, you know, da-da-da. And somewhere along the line, there may, it may be there. And then someone puts one and two together and gets three, and now they've got your right <coughs> That's what I mean by that. It's uh, and you know we had a, a, a case the other day where a user had a, a password score, password strength website or something like <coughs> passwordscore.com. Huh? And 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 then there's a legitimate one, but and and the legitimate one was I was thinking this it's it's by a you know kind of a you know your your identity is not captured. It's just what is the password? It says how strong it is compared to you know all the keys that get put in. So it's just text, and uh, I'm still a little leery of that one. But I I went out there and went all right. So this guy that was compromised had a password score of 53 and his uh, and his IT team thought that was well it's a pretty good score wow, that's a there's a whiteboard I'm just right on this wall here <laughs> they won't notice, <laughs> they won't notice. Um, so I, I said all right let me go see what I don't know what password to use but I don't, I don't like 54 I kind of like 94 104 those kind of things so I went uh, Leave that there. That's fine. Uh, I went and typed in capital P at sign S S W O R D. Not even with the zero. The, the you know we've I think we've all may have used that one a time or two. Password with a capital P and an at sign, and that got a fifty four, which was one better than. I'm like, well, okay, go back to your user, and go back to the team. Because that's not that's an acceptable one. Don't be using passwordscore.com to evaluate your <laughs> password strength. Define it. No dictionary, no reuse, no sequence of numbers. You all, you all know them, you've written them. He must have used his dog's name to get a dictionary. Yeah, something. Uh, so, when, you know, on that previous thing, whoops, the uh -huh. Yeah, I could. <laughs> Sorry about that. You can go over all of those password policies too, because have one in place where could be no three characters from a dictionary, including substitutions with special characters. Yeah. And you could spend five or six minutes trying to come up with a pattern that it would take. So you like to eliminate eight percent of the actual possible passwords. What is what is the best type of thinking around a password while we're on that? Cash for a 9%. Everyone, everyone gets to A. You all get 20 hours of CPE for attending this <laughs> meeting. We have that right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You could write that up for us, yes, sir. Uh, no, that's exactly it. Uh, taking a passphrase and incorporating special character, uh, uppercase, mixing it up a little bit. But if you take, um, like, uh, this is the greatest day in my life. Those words, the sentence with the capital T on it, 
and you take the first letter of every one, or maybe you create and take the second letter of every word, that might be a little trickier, but you've got something you remember, and then you put some complexity into it. Um, that becomes a strength that is nearly impossible to crack. Yet we can't get behind ourselves to, you know, to, but people do go overboard. Well, one colleague said uh, their, their environment had a minimum password length was, I think, eight characters. I said, well, that's pretty good. No, 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 we want to institute 16 to 20 characters on password. I'm like, you know what? If you instituted passphrases, you'd probably have some passwords that achieve that length, and people would actually not write them down. But we used to have the, back in the day, I'm going to get to you with this. Back in the day, we used to have uh, debt vaxes. When I was a young student, I managed a cluster of debt vaxes. Clustering was kind of neat. And vaxes were pretty cool. And the, the, IT, the MIS manager, enabled um, uh, automated password assignments oh, yeah. for the user's ID. Uh, so eHiggins or whatever my, I think it was eHiggins, and then the password that spit out was WYSIPAC. I remember it, it was <laughs> a long time ago. It was in 1985, I think. Like WYSIPAC. AOL. Yeah. WYSIPAC. I, I think it had like a, a number at the end. Um, I remember it now because it almost put my career in motion to be a security guy. I want to I want to do this right. I want to provide good governance. And I, I remembered it. But you know what? I didn't remember it when I got it assigned. And like you were kind of getting to, I had a sticky note on every tube, <laughs> every tube that I would go to. Well, uh, Higgins was here. There's this whizzy pack. <laughs> And they never changed them, when, except when the sysadmin pushed out a new change. On that, um, I helped a small motorcycle shop set up in the wood. And I did the network portion. I did a passphrase, which is the number substitution. His favorite movie had a number I can remember. He never calls me on that. He chose his Wi Fi password, and I had call us with. <laughs> So passphrases are definitely better. Passphrases are better. They're more secure. They're they're not conforming to those rules. You had a question. Oh, I was saying the worst one I went to was again a system that automatically assigned passwords <coughs> as I think it was six pronounceable syllables, theoretically pronounceable. Wow. Yeah. How does how, how do we remember them? You know what? In those times, like. The only way I could remember it was a sticky note, yellow pad, a, you know, yellow sticky. Um, today I might be cool with that because I, I might use one password or some of these, some of the password tools are maybe, and I'm not advocating one, I just said one I might use. There's a lot of great ones out there. They're strong, they're encrypted. Um, you know, that probably brings an argument up of putting them all in one basket. But um, if we if we can kind of keep an eye on that basket, at least we you know, can use different passwords on different systems. I think that's a, a, a kind of endemic problem. But the bad guy gets in to that very thing. What may be weeks and re weeks of reconnaissance, a thumb drive, I've, I've seen it, a bag of 100 thumb drives, the little ones, the cheap ones, thrown in a parking lot, and then, ta -da! And every all the Christmas tree lights up, and if you're a fan of the Vault series from WikiLeaks, the CIA tools that have been yeah. leaking out, um, Thomas Source Code just came out, which is a control framework for their malware and the user ops guide. I'm not a I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I was real interested to see what kind of tools are in that. And there's some interesting ones in there. Uh, not about looking through your Samsung camera and that's built into the TV, but the the you know take owning a owning a PC and uh, and uh, the the malware utilities and some of the control. I think they call this latest one Hive. I think that's going to create a new a new attack surface or a new wave of attack behaviors that are on the low side. And all the low is there for is that. 
is, is to get in the door. And like that previous slide, get in the door, establish a means to get back in the door, move laterally, Who's, where's my stuff? Where's my admin? When I was in that energy pen test, and oh, by the way, that 200 out, the 200 days, I my assignment, I had 15 hours. I thank God he left me that um, abandoned exchange server because I handed them their report in 15 hours. I, I had accomplished, screenshot it not the finger on the red button, but I screenshotted the control panel where I, the, with, with, with the, the software tool and said, there it is, and, and then suspended my test. That would be really inappropriate for it. And that was a boundary condition. Capture the flight, but don't, don't, don't touch it. And, um, but if I had 200 days, imagine what any of us in this room could have had. So the bad guys are afforded that time. So they sit lurking for a couple hundred days, elevating privilege, finding who's the top guys, owning it. You know what? Goes back to the first slide, which I won't go back all the way to, to the zone of trust and the firewall rules that say allow anything outward. So we've got to change the way we think that. Uh, next gen firewalls are doing a much better job than layer two, layer three, and dealing with IPs and ports and stuff. But they still treat things as if it were a perimeter. Make sense? Yeah. And we can get past the perimeter. Uh, oh, another statistic, which is not really tied to his. You, you know, once, we, once you get to here, then you steal it. And then you sell it. And or you hold it for ransom. And then you sell it. The bad guy is going to say, I'll not disclose that stuff if you pay me $4 million to this bank account wire fund within the next 15 minutes. Crap. Boom, 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 boom. And then they still sell it. Don't, don't think there's any camaraderie there. Thank you for doing business. Your secret's safe with me. I've never met a hacker that's that. Uh, not a hacker. We're all hackers. The, 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 the new term of hacker. Um, another thing that causes exfiltration of data here is, is kind of a human behavior. And it combines, remember we talked about GDPR, that regulation of right to be forgotten. And um, we talked about um, data uh, being more mobile than ever before. Think about these things. Um, a survey, and I believe it, I've done it. Guilty. I've done it myself. Um, not as a not as a uh, common practice, but as a as a, as a bailer outer sometimes. Eighty seven percent, that's almost ninety percent, of IT management have admitted to copying a corporate file to Dropbox or some of the like. I just drop us, it's easy to say, but well, there's a hundred different public cloud storage identity. Think about that. Now think about the right, right to be forgotten in GDPR, this law. Um, they wrote that law because EU doesn't trust US practices, especially about HIPAA. And you know what? I don't blame them. I, I really don't. And I think we're all here to do good work, but it doesn't. It's not, it's not that great. So they, they're instituting something that has uh, teeth in it, right to be forgotten. And um, how do I say it? The uh, behaviors of marketing and salespeople. It's an interesting, when, not a lot of people, people looked at me funny. But, no, it's not funny. <laughs> they, um, what, masters of social engineering? They didn't think of that. No, 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 no. They didn't think of, um, didn't think of this too much. The law writers have apparently nailed it. But um, I've never 
I've never met a sales guy or a marketing organization. This is not it's a little negative, but it's hard to change it. That will actually really delete the contact. I've known sales guys that will take contacts from one company to the next to the next. They they think they own the you know the corporation says, oh, excuse me, we own the customer list. And the sales guy says, well, I've been calling on these guys for the last 50 years or 20 years or 10 years. So I own the sales list. But uh, now think of one of those contacts as a natural person of the EU. French guy says, I want to be forgotten. So it's carried on. And it's not so much the, the carrying on of that there's a it's a bad act, but it's, it's not so much that. It's changing the behavior. A policy, a law has come out that is going to change, for, well, actually, it's, it's going to force us to change a behavior that's been so hard. Uh, like I said, go to your marketing group and say, these five major, major customers asked me to delete every record about them, their name, their address, and their affiliations. Don't go. Hello. Because it's cultural. We can't be we're hoarders. We don't and marketing and sales to the respect of them, they their job is to find new ways to contact people that might have said that they were uninterested at one point. So we don't have to work on that, especially if we're in businesses that are connected adjacent to uh, to, to uh, GDPR in, in, that, in that one space. And you know, some of that stuff might even lead over to the way we do governance in the US. Um, the Dropbox filed storage is a kind of a similar byproduct of that. So data exfiltration is actually uh, can sometimes for convenience and it becomes a risk item as well. And that's not, we spend a lot of time on that. So tenants, tenants of Zero trust. This woman said it earlier. Access must be earned by all devices and, and, and users at, at all times, every time. Not just one and done, but every time. Network access control, remember the concept of NAC? And uh, you will meet my standards. Well, you know what? The Microsoft guys have Intune, you have to configure a device. You can allow your users to buy a, a company to buy me my phone. I bought me my phone. I'm using the same phone number I've had for the last 20 years. I'm enrolled in my company. There's an ethical relationship where that company has device management capabilities, but there are ways to distinguish these are the portions that we sanction, these are your own, and I get the benefit of additional security tools to protect me. Could they look at everything I'm doing? Yep. It's my employer. I have, I have to have a relationship with them, with them. So if I want to use it, there's a, there's a give and a take. And there's an ethical obligation on us as IT and security people to you know, go wrong with people's privacy. So there's, there's that. But taking a device, going to Fry's or Best Buy and buying a PC that the company says, just get your own. Log in to the web with your credential, hit the button, and that Intune, it's a Microsoft, there's all the other technologies, but that's pretty cool. Um, we'll configure the device, and by the time, you, you know, if you do that in a, on a, on a uh, web, in the parking lot, and then the device, given the time, will update the sanctioned apps and configuration. And boom, that's a kind of a neat way to provision devices and securely and every time I authenticate. And so, and ensure that all the data and resources are accessed securely. There's technologies that one could apply, you know, DLP centric that says, anytime I communicate a, a piece of information, look for patterns of, you know, social security number. Uh, trade card information, stuff that I'm concerned about, this word next to that word, you know, and filter it or take action on it. Some of that action may be recognize it as sensitive, pop a message to the user and say, 
this kind of meets a criteria of, of, a, of health information. Do you, you really want to do that? If you say yes, it sends a note to your boss to say, do you approve of that? Yes. No, no, no. It, and, and if that's the workflow. And, and that's what I'm getting at. There's a, there's a workflow. So ensure that data has that. You have to know what data you have. You have to know where it flows. Payment card industry did a really, really good job of defining the cardholder data environment, the things that are around that perimeter, and uh, and and recognize that the, that perimeter has fewer or let's call it no boundaries. So that their their approach, uh, I think we'll see some zero trust. Not the words, but the types of thing that say everything must be earned. In a, in a trust relationship, the PCI is probably going to kind of expand upon that within themselves. But they do a pretty good job of making us define where our data flows. So we know what we've got, we know where it goes, and then we, then we can learn how to protect it. And user, and uh, where the user, I'm, I'm inside the LAN, I'm outside the LAN, I'm in a phone loop, I'm in a Starbucks. Should have should have no bearing. It shouldn't have any bearing on how my corporate treats me. And I can do the same level of scrutiny whether I'm sitting on the wire inside the office or in a Starbucks. And um, least privilege uh, from audits. Uh, least privilege seems to be a tough one for for people. I don't know if it's that. If it's convenience, is it we're too busy and so oh, geez, here, here's the whole security matrix access. I'll, I'll shut them down when and we forget about them. I, you know, I don't know what it, what it is, but um, people tend to have more privilege for the systems and the data that they that they need to do the job. So the regulations pull you into that, and um, we kind of need to do a better job of least privilege. And some of the regulations say that you ought to. Um, you, know, ought to, you have to re-sanction those levels of access uh, periodically, like a quarterly review of Ed's access. Is it what he needs to do his job and, and, and you know, approval by my boss, you know, that kind of thing. And then privileged user. The privileged user is the one that that bad guy wants to get. So privileged user to the fewest people they have it, but then at the same time, you can't just have one guy with priv user because now he's a risk point. Not, not him as a bad guy, but he's a single point of failure. So priv user is like a two guys with the hands on the button, and when they do that, it might issue a password for temporary use of the root account. So, believe it or not, sometimes that SA or the root account is needed. Uh, Suit as you suit who doesn't doesn't always get everything, and so there's way there's processes. So we need to look at those processes. And so and the other thing is log everything to an immutable. Immutable, it can't be changed. And you know our logs and our SIEMs. Who who here has a SIEM or security information event management? So pretty much everyone. Are you pretty happy with it as far as a technology that? brings all your logs and events together. Yeah. They're, some of them are really, really good. The problem is the sheer volume. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. It's log and the logging here is um, to be able to go back and and, and say did 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 that did that match did the accesses match the, the thing. And of course the big thing about logs is if you don't keep a time signature a lot of people forget that part where time stamp is important, even to the millisecond. And um, synchronizing all your devices and servers time to a common clock is the, the way to do it. But most of you probably already know. A few people I talked to a couple of weeks ago weren't as up on that. We forget. <clears throat> so why is a new approach? That's the one we talked about. That's that metric. Compromised ID is the root of most breaches. Um, 
low privilege accounts. <laughs> Correlation. A low privileged account, and he doesn't have access to the, the servers that are most important. Uh, he's in the general user category. His account was compromised. He's just clicked the freaking button. He's got a compromised ID. But there's this other thing. Uh, he can't. He can't do. I'm not saying that security analysts think this way. They would be on, on top of that. But the temptation is to consider a low privileged user as not as much of a threat, a compromised low threat, low privileged user, as much of a threat as a compromised privileged user. Yeah, that is really bad. But we might let the other guy go if we're focusing on something else. And um, that whole thing is the risk. Because that's that's what the bad guy knows is the sweet spot. They don't throw the they don't throw the um, thumb drives into the parking lot where the IT guys park. You notice that? <laughs> they'll do the roll wipe and thank you. They'll re, you know they'll put, they'll put it on a kind of isolated and then have a whole bunch of blanked out thumb drives uh, or just squish them. Uh, they put them where general normal everyday people, we're all normal everyday people, but you know what I mean? People that are in our HR, or, uh, marketing, sales, executive management, uh, uh, people that we support and that support us. That's where they throw them. And it's to get back so that they can go down to the end of the rainbow and that's to steal whatever it is they're and it may not be stealing. It may be to destroy the reputation of the business. That's, that's as bad a mission. Both events, either event rather, it's an or, could zero the business existence within 30 days. God bless you, And so what that kind of shows us is we need a new approach because most, most organizations do deal with north and south. The bad guy on the outside, the cloud in the picture, goes through the firewall, goes into my soft GUI network. We've all drawn that on a napkin one time or three. And this way is often when I'm in the DMC and I'm going next to another DMC, I have a level of trust. We should not trust any of that. And when I'm in my internal network and I'm going east-west, I should not trust any of that. So thinking about things differently can kind of um, kind of help us along the path. These things, these things are not going to change with expand with respect to expanding our digital presence, data that our company offers and manages and provides and consumes, um, reaching customers in new exciting ways, um, new relationships with partners, and, uh, insurance to hospital to physician, those kind of relationships. Um, they, they all, um, and when, when they go through firewalls, when they go through the north-south type of sort of controls, they, they uh, if they're obstacles, people create shadow IT. I need to get the job done. That's, I think, why that 87% statistic comes from people admitting I use strong ones. Because I had to get sales presentation to the guy in the other end or the, the new app dev process and the source code to be in his hands so I could put it on Dropbox for the moment. Got on a plane, had my Bluetooth compromised, but never mind that part. <laughs> so anyway, uh, these all plug in. It, this is a very small but very common circle of things that make up control frameworks. Take any framework, ITIL, uh, ISO, NIST, they all expand upon something in and around that. And every device and every relationship should plug into that. So what about things like, I just crank those in, 
and IoT, shadow IT. Uh, you, you're all familiar with shadow IT. I'm not saying something that's kind of weird. Um, it, it, it is, and it's also, uh, you know, uh, I tell a story, but I don't want to waste your time with another story. Um, maybe it's a kind of a good one. IT had wireless access points that had passwords in guest areas. It was often very difficult to get the password to a visiting guest. And so a help desk request, we've probably all been there, done that. And there's better ways of doing that. It's automated today. But a few years ago, what was, it was the case. In his heart of hearts, he went out and bought a you know, wireless lab device at probably Best Buy, Fry's, wherever the cheapest one was, plugged it into an active LAN port, it got a DHCP IP, the any rule to everywhere allowed that to happen, um, set no password, months went past, partners were happy, more people started coming into the conference room because they had a pretty wide open access, everything was good, until the FBI and the Secret Service showed up at the door, the front door of the building, and said, um, bomb threats have come from this address. They, they were, they, they subpoenaed the ISP to relinquish the address, the physical address of the holder of that IP for that period of time. It was Someone trying to do the right thing, put a wireless access point in a conference room for a bunch of partners that were coming and going. Someone's trying to work. And a guy in the apartment across the street was able to jump on because it was wide open and issued a bomb threat to like the White House. This was a few years ago. I think it was like 2005, 2006. And, uh, Old enough that things have changed, but not old enough that we should forget that kind of stuff can, can still happen. And that's shadow IT at its worst, really. Um, other forms of shadow IT are Dropbox. I have to be able to get this thing working. And so I'm going to pay the 100 bucks for a terabyte Dropbox. I'm going to put every file in the corporate repository out there. And I'm going to share it with my friends <laughs> and that's where the line goes it's, it's not it's it's even not including the line crossing of share with my friends everything about that is is, is wrong <laughs> <laughs> and that concludes our session for the day <laughs> just said remind me in 10 days <laughs> no, my company, I, I can do that twice, and then they're going to say, I'm stuck with presentation, I probably need me to click it off. So, quit, quit, quiz, exercise, kind of like that. What would you do differently if every user in your environment came to work with a BYOD, bring your own device or mobile? Would you would you look at things differently? It's almost true anyway. Yeah. Yes. My kids take a selfie, do their corporate HR. I do. I don't do as much selfies as my kids do, but but for them it's seamless. There, there's not any difference. It's, they're leading the way, and that is infectious to the way we do business. So um, if you're if you're if you can honestly say. I would not do anything differently because I'm already addressing that, then you're probably further along than most. I could skip this one, but this is a kind of an example. It's that Microsoft space. It's, it's, not, it's not a product, it's just one example of many. Enroll an iPad in, into the device is hardened. You, know, the, you still have your personal stuff, your apps, Risk-based authentication, multi-factor, enablement of apps, user device and behavior analytics. That's, that's where we get into the area of um, 
integrity and ethics of like how much of my behavior on my iPad is going to be profiling me for my raise or whatever. So you got to kind of step back from that. And I'm not even addressing that in those parts. Those are legitimate things that IT, the business, and the user employee community need to understand up front. Uh, and then the, the, the logging, being able to travel anywhere. What happens if, you know, Ed has got his phone, <laughs> I do all my work in this general area. Our headquarters is in Austin. I visit San Antonio. I go up to DC. I tend to do my work somewhere in that space. My behavior kind of does that. And all right. Uh, what happens with when you know Beijing has me doing the same thing? Should that trigger an alert? Yeah, probably so. And so, you know, behavioral analytics is, that's what that, that thing is kind of profiling. Being able to travel anywhere, identify, and then if I quit, if I just said, I hate the company, I quit. The company has the right to remove my access. Do they wipe my phone? You know what? In today's technology, they don't have to. They can just say revoke access to ed.higginscountablesystems.com. Revoke my access. And you know what? I may still have all those files all that data in, that in all that data in that envelope. You're right. It, it's, it stays there. And it's, it's different technologies handle it different ways. But it may stay there, but now it's, 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 not, accessible. it's not accessible. Just wasting my Dropbox space. There are ways and there are technologies to do that. This is one loose example. There's tons of really good technologies. DLP has come a long, long way. And in fact, they should do that just because of the anomaly. They can always turn it back on. That's right. Um, and that's a, that is a triage technique. That Beijing thing, suspend this account. Don't delete it. Don't wipe it. Just free them. And then when he calls screaming and yelling and justifying what the deal was, then say, our bad. We were watching out for you and your data. Uh, that's now part of your behavioral profile. I have a UFC fight pass, and I used a VPN to get around, you know, blackout. Mm -hmm. And they, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, Wells Fargo does a pretty good job of the the banking. If, if something happens that's out of my area, I'll get a. Uh, I think I might have even signed up for it, but. They may just do it anyway. I get text messages saying card not present transaction. Can I jump in real quick? Yep. Um, all the other sessions are ending and they're starting to do the drawings. And somebody should have told you you were running out of time. Uh, well, yeah. They did. It's 11.50, which is over now. We're starting at 12 at the drawing. Yeah. What time is it now? 11.50. Oh, so, so this is like my last 30 two, seconds. Two minutes <laughs> over. Yeah. Oh, well, this is the last slide. <laughs> yeah. It is going to be the last slide. So. Advantages of zero threat, it make, uh, zero trust. It makes lateral breaches harder. It lets us say yes more. The rest of this is all in the middle. It removes the need to deal with DMCs and zones because now we look at things a different way. So thank you all for. Thank you.